spotlighted and I'll wait for you to okay. respond. Thank you very much. Uh, so we did. Um, thank you for <laughs> Sorry, organizing you... all this. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you for organizing all this. It's, I think it's great. Uh, but I think a problem for all the young people that are attending this is that you may be exposed to far too many success stories. I mean, success stories are certainly inspiring, but also kind of depressing if they're in large numbers. So uh, I will try today to give you a little bit something different. So not a failure story, but at least to convince you that a little bit of failure is okay. I mean, you can become a luminary even with a very bumpy road. So uh, today you will hear about fish failures, flanking exams, serendipity, which is the fancy name we scientists give to luck, random academia, rejected papers in nature and science, and how bringing people out for dinner is in general your best move. Um, so there was really nothing uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, strange about my upbringing, uh, apart from the fact that I come from a long line of fishermen. Uh, these are my parents. Uh, um, this is me. We like to fish amberjacks. And even though I knew that my parents did also other things, like my father was a human physiologist, my mother was a biologist, but most of our interaction when I was a kid was amberjack based, basically. And I'm really doing my best to continue that kind of line. So this is my family with a good old amberjack again. So after all this uh, uh, formal fishing training, I landed in uh, physics um, and I started a, a master thesis in Milan about charge density waves. So I liked physics. Uh, I started my master in 93 on charge density waves and I would love you to explain what they are, but I can't because uh, this was the first big failure of my career, uh, because in 93, I had to choose between uh, doing uh, the military service or the civil service. Uh, I chose to do the civil service and I spent uh, 12 months doing uh, community service in a drug rehab, where I could do almost no physics or very little physics. Uh, so one day my supervisor, my master supervisor called me and told me, you're too slow, you can't work enough. So I'm doing your project to someone else and he hung up the phone. So that was uh, uh, <clears throat> kind of a big uh, devastating moment for me. So no more charge density waves. I don't know, I still today don't know what they are. And so bye-bye Milan. And uh, I moved to Trieste, to Sissa, uh, where I found uh, a very fine gentleman, Giuseppe Mussardo, who was my first mentor. He did conformal field theory in two dimensions. He still does conformal field theories. Giuseppe understood that I was in a very, uh, I was in a comatose state. So he just gave me a book, this book here, which I strongly recommend. Uh, and he told me, take as much time as you want, just study this book, have fun, which I did. And it was great. I kind of spent three months only reading that book. And that was also my the first time I had some real formal training in statistical mechanics. So I managed to scrap a, a, a master with, uh, with Giuseppe, but since I was in fact, a very good PhD school. So, of course, I had to apply for a PhD position there. I was an internal candidate, so I was in a very good position, and I flanked the exam. Uh, so, there are many versions of this story. I remember that they asked me the mass of the pion. Uh, some people say that they asked me the mass of the proton. Anyway, I didn't reply. I didn't answer, so I flanked the exam. So, uh, no CISA for me. And uh, so I started doing a PhD exam all over Italy. And I got a position in Rome uh, with this uh, gentleman here, Giorgio Parisi. So I would like to tell you that I went to Rome because Parisi was there, but actually I was young and not very knowledgeable of the whole field of physics. So I actually went to Rome because Rome was fantastic and still is. So I remember walking that morning and say, I have to win the position here because this place is amazing. It was my first time in Rome, but then also working with Georgia was quite amazing. Difficult, but amazing. Uh, I met Irene, uh, so more Amberjacks, and uh, we worked together because Georgia gave us a, a very nasty calculation to perform. So it could only be done in, in together in two people. So those were great years, but at the end we had to find a, a postdoc and that was a nice story because I remember there was 10 people, 10 students like me and Irene in, a, in, the, in the student room and all of us were doing spin glasses. So we're all students of Georgia. And at some point, uh, uh, this gentleman here materialized on our doors. He knocks on the door, 
and say, hello, I'm David Sherrington. Uh, I'm looking for Giorgio Parisi, can you help me? So at that moment, basically all of us were working on the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, which was the most famous model of spin glass, it still is. So it's Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, you're studying the model, and then David Sherrington shows up on your door. And and everybody realized that George has completely forgot about him. So it was very awkward. It was a terrible moment. So there was a kind of a few seconds, everybody staring at each other. And Irene and myself looked at each other. And then we said, yes, hey, hello, here we are. So come with us. So we brought him out for lunch. We spent the entire afternoon talking to him about what we were doing. Everything was very fresh because we didn't, uh, we didn't prepare anything. We brought him for dinner the next day he offered us a, a, a postdoc in Oxford. So you see, this is luck. Uh, really, uh, was a lucky break for us. Oxford was uh, uh, great. I did some, uh, again, some glassy stuff, structural glasses. I started doing some interdisciplinary things like econophysics. Don't ask me about that. And I moved to a second postdoc to Manchester in 2000, where I worked with Mike Moore and Alan Bray. Uh, the two great uh, uh, English gentlemen on uh, ordering kinetic and the dynamic renormalization group. Those years were really chaotic from the personal point of view because we were together in Oxford, Dinner and I, she went to Paris, I went to Manchester, we got married while she was in Paris and I was in Manchester in Rome and that was a logistic nightmare, I do not recommend that to anybody. Anyway, after a few years we landed back in Rome and uh, as Irene said, there was the big uh, uh, turning point when we started doing uh, biophysics, uh, actually we started doing starlings. So the question is, how could I turn from a theoretical physicist into an experimental biologist overnight? Because the first breakthrough we did on starlings were really uh, about getting experimental data in three dimensions. And that was extremely risky because uh, I spent uh, uh, more than two years with no papers at all. And I remember that everybody was very worried. Even my father was telling me, wouldn't you better off going back fishing amberjack? So everybody was worried. I was publishing no papers. How could I afford to do that? Uh, well, this is the answer, which is also the only piece of science I would put it together today for you. So this is the correlation between merit or your results and your career advance and progression in the Italian academia. So there is no zero correlation, nothing. So uh, I'm not saying that this is good, of course, actually it's bad. And many people have to go abroad, many Italian brilliant guys have to go abroad because they cannot find a position here. On the other hand, for me, it worked okay because you know nobody cared. Uh, you do a great work and you get no position. You sleep the whole day, you get a professorship or, or the other way around. I'm not saying this is anti-correlated, but certainly not correlated. So I could spend an insane amount of time checking for small experimental details about how to calibrate and align cameras on the roof of a museum with no paper produced and you know, nobody cared. Probably had it been at Harvard or Princeton, there would be uh, uh, not that part of my life and career. But anyway, after some years, we got some result. And even I was uh, kind of eager to publish that. So we discovered that the interaction uh, uh, in, uh, in Starling Flux was topological, not metric, uh, which was fairly new at the time. Uh, we thought it was a big result. Uh, and so, of course, you have a big result. What you do, you submit it to nature, right? And it was rejected. Actually, it was rejected after 70 minutes. I remember submitting the paper, going picking up my daughter at school, but bringing her to the swimming pool, opening up the phone, and the paper was already rejected by the damn Henry Gee. So we submitted to science, uh, and it was rejected again. At that, it, with science, it went to the referees at least. Uh, but the ref one of the referees, I still remember, said that the work was not holistic enough. At the time, I thought that holistic was an expletive. I didn't, I, mean, I didn't know the word. I mean, so it was not holistic enough. Anyway, uh, it was rejected. So, but who cares about glossy magazines? At the end, the paper was accepted in PNAS. Uh, now he's got more than 1800 citation, which is fairly okay. So don't worry if your paper get rejected in nature and science. You can always quote me if you get depressed. And uh, that put uh, uh, our work on the map. So this was how we met Bill, or uh, Irene already told you about our meeting with Bill, how crucial it was for uh, actually really for our, for broadening our horizon towards uh, uh, the US. Um, so 
I would like to sum up now my main message with three uh, famous quotes. Uh, the first one about failure and resilience uh, and uh, is the famous one by Edison. Genius is 1% inspiration and 97% perspiration. So I don't know about genius. However, whatever good you have has to be protected by a lot of perspiration, uh, part of which or 99% of that perspiration is resilience to failure and setbacks. So uh, that is very important. Luck is important. I mean, yeah, they call it serendipity. It's just sheer luck. So I like to quote uh, Napoleon on this who said, I would rather have lucky generals than good generals. It's probably he never said that, but he could have said that, so it's okay. And knowing about luck is important. You cannot generate luck, but you can actually, it helps you uh, having a more balanced approach to your failure and your successes, especially if you remember the third quote, which is the only, I mean, serious quote I want to give you today and piece of advice, uh, uh, which is uh, by Pasteur, which is fortune favors the prepared mind. So yes, uh, be there and try to be prepared for when luck comes. So good luck. Thank you so much for this fantastic talk. Uh, we have time for um, one or two questions from the audience. Does anybody uh, wanna go? Uh, Raphael, you can unmute uh, yourself. Hello. Uh, yeah, th thanks for a, for a great talk and also for showing all, like not, not cherry picking only the successes, but also showing the life from all sides. So could you could you describe some some like what kind of difficulties uh, are like you faced in grad school, uh, for example? Sorry, what kind of difficulties I face where in, in graduate school, like working with Parisi and well, uh, the difficulties working with Paris is that we went visiting him about once every two months. He spoke, we didn't understand a word, and then we got out and we discussed about that for two hours, but there were two of us. And so at the end of the day, we kind of decrypted what he wanted to do. We did it, uh, we did other things. Uh, sometimes we misjudged, it, but I don't remember kind of great difficulties at grad school, to be honest. I mean, that was the, it was a fantastic time. I remember difficulties with your first postdoc. At the first postdoc, at least at that time, you were not enrolled on a specific project, right? It was probably, it was more relaxed. So they gave you a position, a desk, and they say, okay, now you produce papers and you do something. And after being a student, when you have a project, you know what to do and so on, being totally free, uh, that was hard at the beginning. So I remember that that was the, the, the main difficulties I had as a, as a young postdoc. But in grad school, I mean, in Rome, it's really hard to face, I mean, difficulties in Rome, yeah, no, they just don't happen. Okay, thanks. All right, a few other hands, uh, Glenn, and then Navish. Hi, Glenn. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'll use my personal knowledge to say that um, you were, you pretended that you were doing the Starling thing and, and nothing else, but I know that you were working a lot on glasses and a lot of other topics during the same years for like at least a few more years and also Irena. So I'm curious how you balanced like trying to start something new with keeping your foot in stuff that you were very comfortable with. Well, you, well, yeah, you're right. I did some glasses while I was starting uh, in this, this birth things. But in fact, what happened was the following. When I started studying starlings, it was really a, a sharp cut. After two years, uh, I still had no results. So I remember going back to Tomas Grijera and Paolo Verrocchio, the were my main collaborators at the time, saying, guys, you have to save me. I've not been publishing anything for two years. I didn't have a permanent position at the time, I already had a kid. So let's do something together about glasses. And we did. But if you check carefully, those uh, will be my last papers on glasses in, in uh, 2008, I think, which was also the, the year when my first paper on, uh, on Starlings Right. So, yeah, the rule says uh, do that carefully and gradually. Uh, this is not what I did, but because uh, I, I had this kind of, uh, of environment, right? Okay. So if you have some more correlation, yes, I strongly advise that you do, that you're changing your field very gradually, but sometimes it's very hard. I mean, I really have to spend a lot of time on the roof of, the, of that museum getting the data. So uh, 
sometimes it's not easy to do two things at the same time, but I don't have a general recipes. It was a mess, Glenn, to be honest. All right, so Navish, go ahead and then Shri, and then we'll move on to, uh, to the next section. Oh, okay. Thanks so much, Arit, and uh, thank you for a fantastic, riveting, gripping talk, Andrea. Uh, I have so many questions, but in the interest of time, I'll choose one, which is, um, it seems, we, we've never hear stories from people who tell us, I didn't publish for two years and everything turned out okay. So I guess my question to you is, what is your attitude towards the publish and perish culture, publish or perish culture? <sighs> Big question. Um, let's say, I don't advise to do the same to my students, if this is what you're asking. Um, but it's a very tough question. I think that they, you have to balance what you really love with what is popular. Sometimes what you, what you love is what is popular. I mean, that is a rare blessing. Uh, some other times what you really like is not very popular and what is very popular is not something that you really like. You have to balance these two things. Uh, to try uh, to, yeah, to do what you like, but you try to do what you like also in the context of a community and environment. If you're able to do that, so if you're not isolated, I don't think that then publishing is really an issue. Um, so the really important thing is not to be isolated. So if you're young and you don't have that many papers, I don't think it's, it's, it's terrible, provided that you are embedded in a network of people if you are totally isolated and doing something which only you and your supervisor like, I mean, despite how many paper you can publish, that is not good. So I would say it's a little bit like sex. You can do that alone, but it's normally much more fun to do that with other people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, uh, with that, I think we should uh, move on for the interest of time. We're gonna skip the next breakout session.